Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. All right, so welcome back to school Sunday. Getting ready to go back to school this week, most of us are. And so it's a good time to start in with a new uh, series. Take your Bible and we'll go to John chapter 14. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, and you want one, just wave at an usher. They'll let you have one. It's our gift to you. And if you don't know your way around the Bible and you're saying, well, where is John anyhow? Just turn to about three quarters of the way towards the back. Just roughly right around there if you see Matthew or Mark or Luke or Acts. You're you're kind of in the area. All right, so we'll go to John chapter 14. And while you're turning there, I'll explain a little bit of what we're going to do today and for the next two Sundays. I want to talk about Jesus. You say, well, isn't that kind of basic? Doesn't everybody kind of know about Jesus? Well, on our uh, staff, we've been challenging some assumptions this past summer. We made a list of more than 50 assumptions, just things that those of us who serve here all the time tend to think. For example... One of the assumptions that many of us have had for a long time is, well, most of the people who come to Faith Bridge live in 77379 zip code. But then you do a pin drop and you realize, oh my gosh, there's people coming from downtown, from the Woodlands, from Conroe, from further, and there's, it's all over. Another assumption, well, you know, Faith Bridge is just full of only just married people with children, young children particularly. Not true. That is a big constituency or contingency, but there's, that's only about half true. There's tons of single people who are part of Faith Bridge uh, and, and other you know, dynamics family-wise. So one of the assumptions that we looked at is everybody just knows who Jesus is. Well, maybe that's not true. Maybe actually it'd be good if we went back and just got everybody on the same page because a lot of times people come for a long time and they're like, I think I do, but if, if you were really asked, you might not be able to explain it very well. There's no shortage of opinions, that's for sure. Some people say, well, Jesus, okay, he's an ideal example. He's the example after which all of us should aspire, right? Or he's a dominant historical figure. That's who he was. He's right up there with the likes of George Washington and Martin Luther King and Gandhi. That's, he's, a, he's a model you know, citizen, an example. That, that's who he is. Other people say, no, 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 he's Jesus, I know he is. He's the rule-keeping piper that everyone's going to have to pay one of these days, right? Deepak Chopra says, New Age guy says, no, it's a, he's a state of consciousness that we're all aspiring towards. Hindus say, he's an avatar. Muslims, Jews say, he's a prophet. Jehovah's Witnesses They say he's the archangel Michael. Mormons say he's not a god, he was a man, but he actually became a god and a polygamist at that. So there's so many different thoughts and ideas and opinions when you talk about Jesus. Just the other day, I I was in an office building here nearby, got talking with a woman uh, who works there. After a while, she connected the dots and said, so you're the pastor of that church on Steuben Airlines that does the big fireworks deal every July 4th. And I said, boom, we're the ones. And uh, <clears throat> she said, we love that. My family and I, we come to that. And, but this year you didn't do it. And we had to go all the way up to the woodlands. And it just wasn't the same. We missed that family feel that, that we always get when we come to your church. And, and I said, I, I'm so sorry. I know, no, 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 I know, I know, no. We, see, we're, we're building this big, great building for the kids in the community. It's going to be fantastic, but we just figured this is going to be safe if we do that and kids up on cranes and driving tractors. It could be really scary. And so just too much liability. So we just had to take the year off and we'll be back next year. She said, well, I really hope so because she said, I I think that's one of the nicest gifts that your church gives to the community. And, and, and I said, well, that's so nice. I'm so glad that we had this conversation. I said, so uh, do you come to Faith Bridge other than on July the 4th? And she said, no, we, we're not Christian. Actually, we're Buddhists. And I said, really? Tell me about that. And she said, well, actually, we're not really Buddhists. Our parents are Buddhists, but we're really nothing. We, it, we're kind of open to anything, and we're just trying to figure it out. 
just trying to figure it out. I think that actually is a statement that could be said of a lot of people. And that's why we decided, let's spend three weeks just talking in very clear terms about who Jesus is. So it doesn't matter what your background is, okay? Maybe you come from Buddhist background, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Catholic. we got a lot of people come from Catholic background and Protestant, people who come from the Assembly of God and Pentecostal and Baptist and Lutherans and Episcopalians and on and on and on. doesn't matter. I want to set all that on the side, okay? We're not talking about that stuff. We're going to set that. I just want to talk about Jesus. And specifically, we want to talk about three things. Who is Jesus? If you're taking notes, here's your outline. Who is Jesus? What did he do? And why does it matter? That's what I want to talk about. <clears throat> so, as I said just a moment ago, uh, we're going to just kind of start in with the basics. I'm going to assume right now that uh, perhaps you don't even know where Jesus was born. Okay? Some of you are like, well, I come on Christmas. I know where he was born. Others are saying, I really don't know. Any more than I don't know where Muhammad was born or Gautama Buddha was born. I don't really know. So let's just start in with some very basics right there. Okay? Jesus was born in Palestine roughly 2,000 years ago, which is just where modern-day Israel and Palestine are today, which is in the news all the time. Okay, right over there, just east of the Mediterranean Sea, right? And he was born into a Jewish family, Jesus was, under Roman rule. Think the days of gladiator, okay? And so that was the world into which he's born. Around the age of 30, his public ministry started. And that's where we get the most accounts of him after the age of 30. And his ministry lasted for roughly three years, and then he was executed on a Roman cross, it's interesting, though. He never traveled more than 100 miles from where he was born. That wouldn't even get you out of Texas. 100 miles, that just, what's that, Beaumont, if you go east, halfway to Dallas, if you go north. He didn't travel a lot of miles. He was always pretty close to where he was born. He never owned a home, never wrote any books, never led any militaries. And, and there was nothing exceptional about his appearance um, as a matter of fact, though, though we don't have any verified pictures of him, we know that he would have been dark, complected like any Middle Eastern man. And we know that he probably was about the average height, five foot something. And we know that he would have never had the chance to use right guard or head and shoulders. They weren't around then. So he would have looked like thousands of other Middle Eastern men 2,000 years ago, just one of thousands of them, which is part of the reason it's, it's rather amazing that we're talking about this one 2,000 years later. And it's not just us who are talking about him here at Faith Bridge. No, 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 it's, it's people all around the world. For a guy who never had a Twitter account, He's, tr he's tremendously famous, ranks number one on all the search engines, magazines like Time and Life and Newsweek and plenty of others have, have made him the cover story countless times. More than 200 movies have been made about Jesus. And you got politicians, you got athletes, everybody drops his name because everybody generally thinks, well, that's a pretty good thing. He's a pretty remarkable man. And yet... Many people, if you probed in, would not be able to explain exactly why is he a remarkable man. That's why we wanted to talk about it. Now, I mentioned a moment ago, he never wrote any books, and that's significant. You say, why is that significant? Here's why it's significant. Because most people feel that there's a bit of a conflict of interest when a religious leader writes his own book. A little conflict of interest. Jesus never wrote any books. Instead, others who walked with him and talked with him, lived with him, watched him, listened to him, they're the ones who passed along the accounts of the things that they saw and the things that they heard from Jesus. And many of them would die painful deaths because of their testimonies about Jesus. But they wouldn't come back from their statements they wouldn't retract from it. They said, hey, I'm just telling you what I saw. I got to tell it like it was. 
Here's what we saw. Here's what we heard with our own eyes, with our own ears. So I want to take a look at one such account. It comes to us from one of his followers whose name was John, okay? So you turn there, John chapter 14, and he's going to give to us a little snapshot of a conversation that Jesus was having with another one of the disciples whose name was Thomas. Some people remember him as a guy named Doubting Thomas, okay? And so <clears throat> Thomas uh, is a little bit fuddled because Jesus has been talking about how he's, he's not, I'm not always going to be with you guys. I'm going to be going back to, to heaven uh, and, and back to being with my father, and, and, but don't worry because I'll come for you and there's many you know, rooms in my father's house and, and, and so on. And, and the, the disciples, they're confused. What, what is he talking about? No, we like you here. Just stay here and let's just keep doing this thing together. And, and so Thomas says this in verse 5. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, for centuries, people have pointed out, this is a staggering claim that Jesus makes when he's talking to Thomas and Philip. He's saying, is there anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Are you kidding me? You, and in another place, John chapter 10, he says, I and the Father are one. Now, can you imagine if, if any of us said that? Can you imagine if I said that? You want to know what God looks like? I and the Father are one. And you're like, oh, no, he's bald, you know, and, and, and this can't be, you know. And others of you are like, you know, when he's not taking the Lexapro, he gets a little cray-cray, but we're going to get him back on. And that's what people would do when you start saying, I and the Father are one. When you've seen me, you've seen God. People, you know, that kind of sort of puts you a little side there, unless you claim to be God. And you can back up those claims, which you can under only one circumstance, if you really are God. And Jesus said it over and over. People didn't pull back from him. They moved towards him. So already you're seeing one of the distinct differences between Jesus and any other major world religious leader. See, all the other major, major world religious leaders st stood clear of every claiming deity. They didn't do that. Because they know if you claim deity, you get lumped in with the people like David Koresh or Jim Jones, and, you, and your movement's going to kind of you know, come to an end. And so none of the other major world religious leaders ever claimed deity. But Jesus said it over and over, and he backed it up. And those who studied him and lived with him and walked, watched him and talked to him, and they said, you know, it's true. He really is. One such person was the great Christian leader, Paul, who would come along and he would write to some Christians in a place called Colossia. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he would say, it's like this. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He's the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, he was saying, if you want to know what God looks like, all you got to do is just look at Jesus. He's the perfect snapshot of God. If, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the very face of God. So the next thing we need to talk about is well, what did he do? Well, what did Jesus do? For this, you've got to have a little background. So you've got to go back to the beginning of the Bible, back in Genesis chapter 2, way back to the very beginning, okay? And back in Genesis 2, we read that God made all type, back in the creation story, he made all type of trees to grow on the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, pleasing to, trees that were good for food. And in the middle of the garden, it says, there were a tree of knowledge of good and evil and a tree 
of life. The tree of evil, the tree of life. And then look at verse 16 in chapter 2 of Genesis. And the Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in this garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. He was saying to them, I've laid before you a choice. I'm giving you a choice. Evil or life. Evil which leads to death or life. And if you know the story, you know they chose death. They said, no, we want to, we want to try that one. Which in a roundabout way is what all of us have done in our own lives. And so the world broke in that instant. And it had just spiraled increasingly into further brokenness over all the years. And, and, and so ever since, it's, it's like humankind has, has just been a progression of millions of dominoes that have just been tipping down, started off by our first parents when they chose sin and independence from God and ultimately death. And if you're not certain, you're like, I don't know if it's so bad. Well, all I'd say is just watch a 30-minute cycle of the news. What do you see? In just 30 minutes, you'll see wars in Syria in Israel, Ebola, virus, outbreaks throughout Africa, ISIS terrorists and beheadings and racial unrest in Missouri and, and violence and human trafficking right here in our city. And, and if you're still not convinced, just think of that the dear girl Cassidy Stay and her family just right here in our community. And then ask yourself again if the world isn't broken. The world is broken. And see, you and I, we're on this planet which is utterly unraveling in sin and brokenness. Even those of us who, who sort of withdraw to the suburbs. The suburbs are safe. That's where we'll live, right? No. We're, we're infected by it as well. You've been infected by sin, and so have I. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. You say, well, you know, I, you know you talk, sin, that makes me a little uncomfortable. I tend to think of the really bad people as the sinful. But I don't really think, no, 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 no. If you're honest, and I hope that you will be with yourself Think of that inner voice that you hear sometimes, that inner voice when you're harsh with a person or you handle a person inappropriately or rudely or painfully, and, and you walk away from that encounter, and this little inner voice says to you, you know, I don't think you handled that situation. I don't think you handled that per I don't think you handled that appropriately. Yeah. Or if you're still not convinced, think of the times that, that, you've, that you've kind of almost lost your mind for a few minutes and you've done something and then you snap back into reality and you're like, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I said? What? Maybe you think we can just make sure that nobody ever finds out about this for the rest of my life. What is that? It's sin and it's infected all of us, none of us are exempt. It's everywhere, the Bible says. It's in you. It's in me. Now, here's the reality. We don't like talking about the consequence of our sin. We don't mind talking about the consequences of other people's sin. We don't like talking about ours, though. Other people, yeah, for example, if somebody broke into your house, stole your possessions, or hurt somebody, or killed somebody in your home, you want to talk about consequences of sin then, Right? for them, because you, you're, there's no way that you're, the next time you're going to see them, just going to be able to let that roll off your shoulder. Yeah, you know, those things happen. No big deal. We'll give them a wink. No way. You want to talk about consequences then. I was reminded of that even just this past week. I was at home one evening, a little bit tired, 
and things were generally quiet in the house, and our boys were off in this little room that they play in, and they love to wrestle. I have two little guys, and they, they're very physical, and they love to wrestle, and, and, but the rule is no punch. You know, okay, you can't hit. And, and then from the other room, I hear a pow, pow, and then one of the kids starts running, ah, help, and he slides in on the, on the wood floor, my brother is hitting me, and he hides behind my leg, and his brother comes around, ah, and he sees me, and he stops, and, and I said, wait a minute, are you hitting him? And he said, yeah, I was. I said, well, just, we're tired, just don't, just stop it. And this one pokes his head out and says, seriously? I'm like, yes. No, that is not all. Now you've got to give him his punishment. That's the other part. In that moment, he wanted the scales of justice to be balanced, right? I want justice, he was saying. And that's how all of us are. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the very God in whose image we are made, in whose image we're created, looks upon his human creation and the sinfulness and the lostness and the brokenness and likewise says, I can't just let that roll off and just say, well, those things happen, no big deal. No, I can't do that. Justice has to be served. The scales have to be balanced. There's got to be a consequence. There's a price to be paid for your sin and my sin. And here's the deal. There's only one person who can pay the price for your sin, and that is you. Unless you could get a substitute who would pay the price for your sin in your behalf. And it's at this point, the very God of creation puts on flesh and blood and steps from heaven to earth and says, here's the deal, I love you with a love like you've never experienced. And justice must be served. And your sin is wretched. Doesn't matter if it's up to your neck or up to your ankle, it's wretched. I'm a holy God. He says, but I love you and I'll pay the price for you. I'll step in as your substitute. As Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 5, 8, God demonstrated his love for this. It, it, think of it, in that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. In other words, when he saw the brokenness of creation, he didn't retreat. He didn't pull off into another galaxy and say, you know, these people just botched the whole thing up. I'm going to go over here into another galaxy and start Earth number two with some new people, and maybe they can get it right. He didn't do that. He didn't move away. He moved towards his creation. And not just a little bit. It's not that he just moved sort of towards us and said, but I'm going to stay tidy on the sidelines. No, he said, I'm going out onto the playing field, which is messy. I'm going into the game, and I'm going to fix what none of you could fix. All of the sin and all of the lostness and the brokenness, I'm going in. I'm moving towards it, not away from it. Sort of reminds me of the story I heard some years ago about Bill Lear. He was the engineer who developed the Lear jet. When he first had the idea in the early 60s, he reasoned, well, there's a, a, a group of people who have so much money and so little time that they would actually pay to own their own airplane and they could just fly where they need to fly and then they could just fly home. And, and his friend said that, you're crazy, Bill. There's no market for somebody to, to own their own airplane like that. But he persisted. And in 1963, he, he built the first Lear jet. In 1964, it sold. And then another one sold, and another one, and pretty soon he had sold 55 Lear jets. 
Who bought them? Oh, various people. Frank Sinatra bought one of them. And things were going along uh, just fine until one of them unexpectedly crashed. And then a second one unexplainably crashed. And at that point, Bill Lear could have said, whoa, I'm done doing the Lear jet. I'm going to go over here and start a new uh, thing over here. And he could have said, hey, I made a good plane. They mostly stay up. And I think that's just pilot error over there. He could have moved away from his creation. But he didn't do that. He moved towards it. He said, no, 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 no. Land all the planes. Don't, don't let any of them go. I got to figure out what is going on and why has this happened twice. And he put on his engineering hat, and he set out to figure out why those two planes had had to crash land. And he gets working on it, <clears throat> and he works tirelessly and cannot figure out what is going wrong. And finally, he reasons the, the problem is happening what's in the air. I'm never going to solve it while I'm here on the ground. I've got to take it up in the air to get this thing solved. So he gets in the cockpit, and he flies the Learjet up to recreate the circumstances under which those two planes had gone down. And sure enough, he recreates the circumstances, and he loses control of the plane. And in that moment, he has the wherewithal to figure out, here's what the problem is. And he fixes the problem, and he's able to save his own life, and he lands the plane, and then he goes and he fixes all the other Lear jets. And the point is, Bill Lear, he could have moved away. He could have said, I am out of here. But he didn't. He moved towards his creation to fix it. And that's what our Heavenly Father did. He could have just whirled us off into oblivion and said, I'm, gonna, I'm moving away from that creation. It just went, no. He said, I'm going to step towards it. I'm going into their world. I'm going to live the life of perfection that none of them were able to live. And I'm going to die the death of consequence that all of them deserve to die. And I'm going to rise victorious from the grave, demonstrating that any who are connected to me will likewise be assured of life. So you say, all right. So you've talked about who he is, and you've talked about what he's done. So one more thing. Why does it matter? Let's talk about that before we stop. Here's why. Because his choice to draw near to us and to offer us the means for life means that sooner or later, you're going to have to make a choice in his direction. And that is, do you want life or not? He said to those disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Choose life. Ring a bell. Don't choose death. Choose life. Now, at this juncture, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, okay, well, you know, that's good for all you kind of church people and religious people, but it doesn't really, it doesn't affect me. I'm out here. I live in the suburbs. I'm fine. I'm healthy. Ah, take my temperature. Take my pulse. It's going all right. Tomorrow school starts. That's a really good thing. And so I'm doing good. Got making good money. Got a good job. Got a good family. All things are fine with me. It's funny. Even when I was writing this last part of the sermon, on Friday morning, I got a text. My phone lit up. And it was from a, a friend, longtime friend here at the church named Mike. And he was texting about his, his wife who'd fought a long battle with cancer. And he texted and he said, she, she just passed about 40 minutes ago. And I thought when I read that text, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? None of us really have our lives as under control as we'd like to think they are. Oh, all of us can prop it up and make certain things about it look, you know, the way that we want them to, to look. But ultimately, none of us are really in control. Ultimately, all of us are headed towards death. All of us are. It's inescapable. From the moment you're born, you're on a trajectory. You're on a pathway towards 
disintegration. You're coming apart. Here's, you don't believe me? Well, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever bought any makeup? Have you ever bought any products? Have you ever bought any fitness club memberships? Have you ever bought any plastic surgery? Have you ever bought any of these sorts of things? Why do you do that? I'll tell you why you do that. You do that because intuitively, instinctively, you know, I'm coming apart. I need more concealer. There's more to conceal. See, all of us are on this pathway towards death. And Jesus says to us, choose life. I'm the way the truth, and the life. Choose life. Here I am. And that's not the only time he said it. Another passage, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Another passage, he said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Why do you think he kept telling people who were alive who he was talking to about life? Could it be that maybe he understood something about their spiritual reality that they didn't understand themselves? Maybe it was because he was saying, I know something about your innards that you don't realize, and that is that your outards are just a reflection of your innards. That's why I came into this world, so that you could have life. So choose life. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. You can go ahead. You can explore every other world religion. Buy all the books, read all the stuff, take the classes, take the courses, weigh it, try to figure it out. But here's what you're going to find out. There's only one true God who loves you and is pursuing you passionately, who longs to forgive you of your sins and to heal you of your brokenness. And his name is Jesus. And so if you're like the lady that I was talking to the other day from the Buddhist background, yeah, not really. I, we're, just, we're open to anything. Or we're just trying to figure it out. Then my invitation to you is explore Jesus. Move towards him and experience life. Move towards him. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And understand, when he said that, he wasn't trying to set off any alarms about exclusivity or I'm better than anybody else and this is all about me and I'm a narcissistic kind of... No, no, no. When he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life... No one goes to the Father, but he was just stating a reality. He was just saying, I'm the only one who loves you. I'm the only God who's pursuing you. No one else is coming for you. No one else is coming for you. I'm the only one that loves you with a never-ending love and who pursues you and who longs to forgive you and who longs to heal you of your brokenness. I'm the only one. So choose life. His name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to talk about you, who you are, and what you've done, and why it matters. Lord, my prayer is, well, I guess it's really kind of for three groups of people. The first group of people I think about who, they came in today and they say, you know, I, I'm open. I, I was open, and I'm, I'm still open. Actually, you give me some things to think about. My prayer, Lord, is that all the people who are in that category would say, at the very least, I'll come back the next two weeks. I want to continue this conversation. I want to think about these things some more. God, I pray that you'd give them the, the um, 
interest to follow those thoughts, not to put them aside, to ask maybe a person or a friend who brought them along today, what do you think about all of this? Have you thought about it all this way? That you'll have them to begin to understand more and more you really are life. And then, Lord, I pray for people who are here who find themselves today saying, you know, I chose life some years ago. I, I remember when this all made so much sense to me. And I went to a camp, and they said it, and I got it. And, but it's like over the passing of the years, I've forgotten this. And I kind of went off in a different direction. And my prayer, Lord, is for people in this category that they would say, I just got reminded of all the things I deep down, deep down knew and have known. I want to come back. I want you, Jesus. I want you to help each person in this category to just to do that business with you right now. And thank you for the grace that you offer, which is amazing and never ending. And then last of all, I want to pray for the category of people who are here and something maybe just already clicked. Just today, it just kind of clicked. Even while we were talking, they're just like, oh my gosh, I don't think I did ever understand. I thought I knew, but I didn't understand. But now I do understand who he is and what he did and why it does matter to me. My prayer, Lord, is that each such person in that category, that they might even in this quiet moment just say yes. I want you, Jesus. I want life. You can borrow my words if you're in this group and you just, I don't really even know how to pray. You say, well, you can just borrow my words and pray these words silently. Lord Jesus, I am asking you to come into my life because I need, I, I need a savior. I need life. I am broken. I am sinful. I am disintegrating. And I want abundant life. I want everlasting life and your life. And so I'm asking you to come into my soul and to forgive me and to cleanse me and to empower me full of your Holy Spirit and to breathe life, abundant and everlasting into me. And in the coming days, I pray, Lord, that you'll teach us more and more what that means and what do we do with it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.